Rachel Scott in Iowa. Thank you. And just back from Iowa and joining us now is the youngest candidate in the Republican primary field, former biotech entrepreneur, multimillionaire and political newcomer Vivek Ramaswamy. Welcome to this week. It's great to have you here right back from Iowa. You know, it's early. We know where you are in those polls way, way down there. Things can change. But you are up against a former president who is polling uh, over 50 percent, a slew of other candidates. What's your path to the nomination? First of all, we've actually studied this. It's good to see, Martha. As in June of 2015, Donald Trump was polling at 4 percent in eighth place. I'm happy to say that we're ahead of that. And I think we're going to take that same trajectory. I'm the outsider in this race. I think you get to be an outsider once. I'm the first millennial ever to run for the GOP nomination for U.S. president. And I'm actually leading us to something. Too long, many other conservatives have been running from something. I'm running to something. What it actually means to be an American. I'm an America first conservative. But I believe that to put America first, we need to rediscover what America is. And I'm seeing the base across this country hungry for that message. And that's how we're going to win. And in speaking of that base, you would have to convince hardcore Trump voters to come over to you. How do you do that? How do you walk that fine line? Well, I'm very clear with audiences. I said it's to audiences in Iowa just this last week. America first does not belong to Trump. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the people of this country. And I think we take that agenda even further if we're doing it based on first principles and moral authority, as Reagan did, rather than on vengeance and grievance. And that's what I'm bringing to this race. The RNC announced the requirements for the first debate, which will be August 23rd. One is to pledge support to the eventual nominee. You have said you would support Donald Trump if he is the nominee. Trump. I expect to be the nominee and I expect support in return. Okay, but you have said you would support Donald Trump. Donald Trump falsely says the election was stolen. He faces possible indictment in three different investigations and has already been found liable for sexual assault. Do you think Trump as president would be good for the GOP and good for the country? I'm running for president because I'm going to be best suited to lead this country to a national revival. That's I know why I'm in this you race. think that, but you said you would support Donald Trump. So answer that oh, question. I've said that to get on the Republican debate stage, I would support whoever the GOP nominee is. But I want to be really clear with you. I think a lot of those investigations against Donald Trump have been politicized, the New York one in particular. But even more importantly, I think it's up to the people of this country to decide who governs. That's the constitutional bargain. And I view it as my responsibility. If I'm to win this race, it's going to be by convincing Americans that I'm actually the best person to lead the country, not by eliminating the competition. Let's talk about Ukraine. You said in a speech in New Hampshire on Friday that you would not spend another dime of American money on a war that does not affect our interests. You don't think the possibility of Russia taking over Ukraine is not is in our interest? I don't think that's a top foreign policy priority. But I did also in that same speech identify no, what I, is I, our I wanna, top priority. I want to stick to this for sure. a minute. You do not believe that Russia taking over Ukraine would be bad for our national interest. I do not think it is a top foreign policy priority for us. I don't think it is preferable for Russia to be able to invade a sovereign country that it's its neighbor. But I think the job of the U.S. president is to look after American interests. And what I think the number one threat to the U.S. military is right now, our top military threat, is the Sino-Russian alliance. I think that by fighting further in Russia, by further arming Ukraine, We are driving Russia into China's hands. And that Sino-Russian alliance is the top threat we've faced. And what I've said is I would end this war in return for pulling Putin out of that treaty with China. How how do you do this? No one tells Vladimir Putin what to do. That has not worked yet. And you said you would want to give him the Donbass. That would be rewarding Putin, wouldn't it? I don't trust Putin, but I do trust Putin to follow his self-interest. I don't think he enjoys being the little brother in the relationship with Xi Jinping. And so what I think we need to do is end the Ukraine war on peaceful terms that, yes, do make some major concessions to Russia, including freezing the current lines of control in a Korean War style armistice agreement. Which Ukraine really wouldn't want to do. Which Ukraine wouldn't want to do. And also a permanent commitment not to allow Ukraine to enter NATO. But in return, Russia has to leave its treaty and its joint military agreement with China. That better advances American interests and actually further deters China from going after Taiwan, which I think is a much higher priority for the United States. Let me ask you this. You want to be commander in chief. So how would you decide what is in the national interest to use the U.S. military? What would the criteria be? What affects the lives of Americans here on American soil? Where are there military threats? Where are there threats to life here in the United States? 
I think the border crisis, 200 Americans dying per day from the fentanyl crisis, 50 times the number that died on 9-11. That's an American interest. Semiconductor security, that's an American interest, which is why Taiwan matters in a way that Ukraine doesn't. But I believe in America first principles, as George Washington did, by the way, avoiding foreign entanglements when unnecessary, unless they're essential for American interests. I shared the George Washington vision of America first. Quick, quick question on, on China. You've seen them harassing our ships, our aircraft, that ship 150 yards from a U.S. ship. What would you do differently than the Biden administration is doing now? I would first abandon the divest to invest program. I think that's actually been a mistake, decommissioning ships that actually have us hit a nadir around 2027, precisely when Xi Jinping could be looking to go after Taiwan. But the second thing, and I come back to it, is break up that Russian-China alliance. Because China's bet is that if they're going to go for Taiwan, the U.S. won't want to be in simultaneous conflict with two nuclear superpowers at the same time. But if Russia's no longer at China's back and vice versa, we're in a stronger position. And no other candidate in either party is talking about this. I think that's the top threat we face. And that's the focus of my foreign policy. I, I want a very quick question here in the end. You were introduced yesterday in Iowa as the intellectual godfather of the anti-woke movement. Would you reinstate the ban on transgender members of the military? I would not reinstate a ban on transgender members. I would, however, be very clear that for kids, that's where my policies are very focused. We should not be foisting this ideology onto children. But, but you would not ban transgender members of the military? I would not. Okay. Thanks for joining us this Thank morning. You. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you. As we said, so much can change in this race between now and next year. Let's take a look back at the state of the GOP primary at this point eight years ago. There you see Donald Trump all the way down at 4% before he officially launched his campaign. Here to help analyze it all are the two people who led National Party